A lot of sociological research is done through interviews and questionnaires, or detailed analysis of secondary sources, like documents and statistics. But some research questions can only really be studied by sociologists getting out of their offices and interacting directly with the people they want to study. This is called participant observation, and that's what we're looking at here. Participant observation means just what it says on the tin. You study a group of people by participating in their way of life and observing their behaviour. And this can be covert or overt. In overt observation, those being studied are aware of the researcher's identity. But not all research questions can be studied that way, so the sociologist has to do covert observation. That is, keep their identity a secret. In his famous study of gang life in Glasgow, Scotland, James Patrick, not his real name, managed to get himself into a violent gang and participate in its activities. Obviously, this research had to be covert. And on the other side of the fence, Simon Holdaway did a covert study of law enforcement, showing that the police themselves were not averse to a bit of rule breaking. The development of participant observation in sociology owed a lot to the famous Chicago School's urban ethnography, where young researchers were sent out to observe different parts of Chicago life, including its underlife. But participant observation research is more than just observing. Researchers talk to people, use artefacts, documents, anything they can get their hands on really, in order to understand the meanings and motives behind the behaviour of the people they're observing. Why do people do it? What's their story? For example, Lord Humphreys explored the tea room trade of what was then illegal male homosexuality. Ned Polsky immersed himself in the deviant subculture of pool room hustlers. Jeff Ferrell explored the world of American drifters, the hobos, as they hitched train rides across the American countryside. And in one of the most famous studies in the sociology of education, Paul Willis studied anti-school subcultures. Why were some kids so much against an institution that was trying to help them and give them the skills to develop a career? What was their story? To research this meant Willis getting into a school, spending some time there and seeing for himself. You can't take second accounts, you can't do statistics, you can't do questionnaires. You have to have direct human contact. You have to get into the place you're interested in. You have to have long-term interaction. You have to observe what they're up to. Willis's study followed 12 non-conforming boys, known as the lads, through their last year of school and into their first year at work. It provided a rich, detailed account of their anti-school attitudes, their hatred of teachers and conforming pupils, something that could only have been done through participant observation. So we've looked at what participant observation is and why sociologists use it, but what are its strengths? What does it give sociologists that other methods don't? The great strength of participant observation over other methods is its high validity. Researchers aren't dependent on second-hand accounts. They're actually there, seeing for themselves. This gives us a better understanding of the meanings behind people's actions. So there is direct human contact here and interaction and my human meaning system was picking up their human meaning system. And participant observation provides innovation, new questions which can be picked up and explored in further research. However, despite its strengths and its popularity in sociology, it's important to recognise both the problems and weaknesses of participant observation. I've done a lot of participant observation research and it isn't easy. It takes a long time to do and there are constant problems and difficulties such as getting access to those you want to study, maintaining relationships with them and recording information. There may well be ethical issues, especially if you're doing covert observation. And you have to avoid going native. That's getting too involved and losing your objectivity. These are real problems, but they can be overcome. However, there are also weaknesses built into the method that can raise questions about the objectivity of the data. Well, as participant observation studies are based on small groups of participants, the data may not be representative, and this can limit generalisation. 
For example, Willis's study only looked at working class British boys. So do his findings apply to students from other countries, from other ethnic backgrounds, to girls? Whilst Willis's research didn't answer these questions, it did provide a model which could and has been applied to other social groups. Another critique of participant observation is it may lack reliability. It's hard, if not impossible, to test and replicate findings. Something Willis accepts. In terms of reliability, I think you, uh, you just can't have everything. You can't have your cake and eat it. It is very difficult to prove that an ethnographic method repeated time and again would replicate results time and again. Another potential weakness is the observer effect. Those being studied may change or exaggerate their behaviour just because they're being observed. But Paul Willis doesn't think this is necessarily a weakness. The very things that were being exaggerated were the things within the heart of their culture that I was interested in. So uh, at some degree of amplification is in one way no bad thing. So what are we to make of participant observation? Well it doesn't provide us with a lot of statistics or tests that can be repeated under control conditions but it does shine a light on human behaviour in real-world situations and that can illustrate, question and sometimes even help change established sociological ideas. And this was the case with Paul Willis's research. It was generally believed in sociology at the time that schools were failing working-class kids. But Willis's research suggested that it just wasn't that simple. Seeing education as totally irrelevant to them, some of the kids just didn't participate and ended up failing themselves. And this was something that could only have been shown through participant observation.